what is being a, a franchisee like? What do you want to tell me about it? And I would say your career will be a roller coaster, a roller coaster. And you have to adapt to enjoying that ride, whether it's at the bottom of the hill or at the top of the hill. You have to enjoy both because th there's no other choice. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Distilled Wisdom. I'm your host, Adam Farrakane. I have a really special guest today. We've been able to get the franchise or perspective over time, but today I have a franchisee and we're mixing things up. We have Lauren Johnson joining us. She owns four different UPS stores in Northern Ohio and has an incredible journey as a mother of four, struggling and building her own business empire. It's an incredible story that everybody should hear. Let's hop into the episode and get to the interview. Right. We have the one and only Miss Lauren Johnson from Quad Coast. Uh, right. She's the president of Quad Coast. Mm -hmm. Lauren, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So Lauren, um, tell me a little bit about you. So you own, hey, am I correct, UPS stores, right? Yes, correct. So my company owns four UPS stores um, looking to grow um, very soon in the future. Um, but currently I own four UPS stores, Northeast Ohio, um, all local to me, 10 minutes from each other, which is phenomenal. I don't think that happens too often, actually. What, so part, of, really... what part of in Ohio? We, we got to start the episode with, yeah, a, yeah, with yeah. You know, throwing your name out there and telling yeah, people yeah. about you. So, so, uh, I grew up, I'm, I'm born and bred Youngstown girl. Um, okay. so more specifically, uh, McDonald, Ohio, which is a square mile in the Youngstown area. And, um, so because I grew up here, you know, I ended up back here. Um, but, but that town was a special place to, to grow up in because it's, you know, in places like that, that are super small, I think there's some beauty in that there's not a lot of change. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's also, uh, the need to learn that change creates something opportunity. And as a kid there, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot going on. So luckily I was lucky to have parents who, you know, took me everywhere. So is um, this like a, so I'm travel. not familiar with it. And I've been in Ohio now a while. Yeah. Is this like a small farm community? Or? It's, it's a steel town. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, McDonald's Steel, which actually just closed this year, which is super, super sad. Um, but, uh, my grandpa, um, worked at that steel mill. My dad worked at that steel mill. It's a steel town. So it's, it's, it's a very special, it's, it's Mayberry is what it is. Okay. Um, and it's like a little time capsule, but there are some really super special people there, um, teachers, um, one in particular named Jerry Gammertsfelter teacher there who who showed the kids there there is a world beyond here there's music beyond this music there there's so much culture and um because of him and many others there i think a lot of the kids you know their eyes were open to wow there's a whole world here and um you know he took our class to new york city and all of those things growing up there um this is high school help, yeah helped me to want to kind of get out of dodge yeah um but eventually, after getting out of Dodge, I, I made my way back here. Well, where'd um, you go? I went to Arizona State for school. Okay. Um, not for any other reason other than I had family there. I had an aunt there, and I had been there to visit. And um, my mother took me to ASU campus, and I remember thinking, this looks like a good place to go to school. Um, not because of academics, not because of anything other than the palm trees. <laughs> <laughs> the warm weather. And I just wanted to go. I just wanted to go. And at that time, there was nothing. Another thing about a small town is you don't see a huge amount of career opportunities for, for, what, for, for what you want to do, right? You're, you know what you're good at, but you're exposed to very little. It's essentially the general store of the steel mill, it sounds like, right? Yeah. You know, there's, there's not... Uh, the majority of the people who didn't work at the steel mill worked. Um, there's local, a couple local hospitals. Um, there's GM. Um, used to be General Motors nearby, so there'd be a lot of people worked there, factories. But you, you didn't see a ton. Other than what my parents did, I wasn't exposed to a ton of what I may be good at, you know. Um, and so I went to college without kind of that idea. What do I want to do? I kind of went in. What'd you go in for? What, like, what'd you pick as your major? I picked business. 
okay. as my major. Um, well, however, it, it well, you know, it's funny because I switched soon after, but I was a creative in that small town. And the thing about creatives is they don't like they don't like being put in boxes. And so I think that's part of why I didn't choose something was I don't want to be put. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. I don't want anybody you know, putting me on a direction when I don't know what I want to do. So I kind of went into business as a, you know, kind of a placeholder. OK, I can get most of my prereqs or whatever and then decide what to do. Um, and that's kind of what happened. I, I, I started in business and then approached my, my um, counselor and said, you know, I'm not feeling, I miss art. I miss my creative side. I miss the things I did in high school. And she said, what about architecture? That's business. That's like business and art mixed together. And I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I switched. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but once I switched, it became, it became clear that um, this was going to be a challenge. This, was a, this wasn't your typical uh, major. This was, this was, this was, you know, um, you had to have a lot of discipline. You had to have a lot of um, intelligence. You had to study. This wasn't ha so ha I'm fun, not fun. familiar with architecture in any way, but yeah. what are some of the challenges somebody learning to be an architect? Like so I, I would say, I would say um, if classes like structures or high end level math classes were a challenge for me personally. Um, some people, you know, it was easy for some people who went into that field. That was hard for me. Um, another challenge is, uh, the challenge for me was never the creative part. I, somebody could give me a, a, a project and say, um, you know, um, create this space that, um, um, draws people to, to create this museum and this is the setting. And I never had a problem kind of coming up with ideas. Um, but for me, it was more of the, um, the, physical requirements at the time to put those ideas on to a drawing in a way that made sense for an engineer to build it you know that's that's difficult and it's and it's something you know that you learn in school so um that that's what my major changed to and i was taught very quickly a lesson in resilience at that point because i didn't make the cut at asu there was a, a certain amount that could move on after sophomore year and I didn't make the cut. So I transferred to Kent State. Was it right grades or why didn't you make it? It wasn't cut? grades. It was more we had to do this um, presentation, this project. And I was up against, you know, everybody trying to make it past that um, that second year into the third, which is where you kind of you kind of you make the cut sure. in order to, to go on, go forward. And um, I just didn't make it. I was going up against people, international students and just people who just were better at the time. I just. I just wasn't good. And and that taught me a lot because in my small town, you didn't not make the team. There wasn't enough to be on the team. So there was no tryout. There was no, you know, everybody built you up all the time. And there wasn't that, there wasn't that lesson in high school. So this was kind of like your first experience with the whole world outside town. Yeah. And it was a hard one, right? Because, you know, my parents had paid for me to get out, go out there. I had established friendships out there and not making it having to move home was a horrible time for me in college because you know it's you, you know, so did you not work. continue couldn't you have changed majors or do you know what i kind of i'm a, a i'm a bit of a stubborn one and i once i committed to that major i said you know what i'm gonna do this i can do this you're not gonna tell me that i can't do it and so i switched to a harder program uh, kent state is uh Kent State is uh, the best of the best. Um, they are, the, it's an amazing program. And so I transferred home um, and eventually, you know, um, did make it through that program. But I, I think that moment at Arizona State made me, made me learn resilience as an adult, you know. Um, so, yeah, then I got back home and I haven't left. This has been my home since. Since it takes then. courage to get knocked down like that and then be able to, you know, dust it off and be like, cool, I'm going again. It, it really does. You know, my son, I'm a mom of, of four kids. And my oldest, my son, Elliot, did not make the basketball team this year, which was heartbreaking for him. And I thought about that moment. You know, I thought about I said, I said, buddy, this is going to happen in life. It's going to happen. You're learning it earlier than I did. But it's one of those things. It's it's it will make you better. 
focus on the things you're good at, focus on getting better, honing your skills and trying again. It's okay to fail. It's okay. Um, and so that was a lesson I learned that help, has helped me uh, in business for sure. Because you know, we all know there's, there's a lot of failure. Yeah, a lot and of failure. I'm curious how that happened. Cause, so you went to Kent and then mm -hmm. you graduated. You became an architect, right? I became an architect. Yeah, okay. I became an architect. And um, um, uh, I was, you know, uh, I practiced for, I want to say I, I did three years at a firm. Um, but I was heavily, heavily disappointed with what the field actually was. You know, you, it's it's one thing in college to be given all these creative projects and, and to do all these artistic things. And then when you're in the real world, um, it, it was just like a bludgeon to the head of a of, 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 uh, uh, surprise. You know, yeah. it's a, this this. Um, and, and for me, my personal experience may have been different than other people. But in my firm, I was assigned to some um, handicap accessibility projects for CMHA, which is Cleveland Metropolitan Housing mm -hmm. Authority. So, um, you know, I was I was seeing a lot of devastation and a lot of sad, sad, sad environments, and my heart was in it. And unfortunately, I work in those conditions all the time. We service a lot of apartment communities in the markets. So, okay, so you're familiar yeah. with it, it. That was tough. Um, not only seeing those things, but that was my job was to measure how far is the toilet away? How far is the wall away? What do we have to? And, and for me, it just was like, as a creative person, I just, I had a moment where I looked across from me, the man who was working across from me, a sweet, sweet man doing the same exact thing I was doing. And I was a year in and he was 35 in. And yep. I looked at him and I had this mental moment where I was like, no, no, I can't. What am I going to do? Um, Combined with the fact that I was pregnant um, three years in with my first child, it was kind of an easy decision to say, look, how about how about pause uh, and focus on my baby, um, you know, and 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 I don't want to do this anymore. Um, what's next? What's next has always been my biggest, biggest downfall and my biggest strength is what's next, because sometimes I just do it without thinking. Um, but in this case, it was the right move. It was the right move. My, my, um, my spouse at the time had said, look, like if, if, if you're going to stop working, you know, let's, we got to figure this out, you know, and, uh, it was super supportive of me, um, starting my own business on the weekends, which was photography. Okay. So I did, I did do that for, um, on Saturdays for about eight years just to keep, you know keep us afloat to keep to keep us having a little bit of spending money what type of photography uh, i did wedding photography okay mostly cool. i did portraiture i did families um um but you know only on saturdays and and i was i was i was very very um you know um passionate about that i i loved the art i loved the creativity uh, i loved the people that i got to meet and i really never i never really got sick of that job I could have done that forever and not gotten sick of it. It I, sounds like a great job, right? You get paid to do something that you obviously enjoy doing. And yeah. I mean, what else could you ask for? Oh, right. And more importantly, that was my first um, experience owning a business. It was a tiny, tiny business and it was just me. But it, it, the bug bit me. The bug bit me. You know, I said, wow, you mean I get paid, but I'm in control and I I can work Saturday. I can work Sunday if I want. I can work Wednesday if I want. You know, it was kind of yep. falling in love after coming from such a structured job. What was your biggest eye opener with it, with being in business for yourself? Are there any things that you didn't expect, oh. you know, right out of the gate? You know, um, a lot of people say like they're scared of taxes and then they figure out, oh, it's not that complicated. But yeah, I, mm. you know, I, I think maybe, maybe for me, it was. Yeah, I'm I all there, there's all these positives to being in charge and to having control over my company. And then there's, oh, gosh, if I make a mistake, if I misstep in any way, it's me and I'm the one like there's no one else. You know, there's no one else. So I think the um the pressure was a surprise for me. You don't go into it. You don't go into it expecting that. Um, and then once you're there, but I thrived off that pressure. 
because it was a constant, you know, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? How can I make it better? Um, and with wedding photography, there's so much you can do to make it better. You can you can keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. I have friends who are who who started around the time I did it and are still doing it, made it through COVID miraculously, because that one of that that field got smashed. Um and they're and they're incredible and they're getting better every day. So it's it's one of those fields that kind of a creative field that where it just keeps evolving, evolving, and you can fine tune your creativity to evolve with what people like to see. Like right now, I feel like people like to see flash mm. photography. It's the trend, right? It's a trendy kind of I'm seeing on social media too. Everybody's the aisle walks. Like they're all making shows out of it. You know, yeah. like the different ways to do it and, and you got the flower guys now with the, you know, going down doing yeah. some crazy dances and stuff. So. The wedding industry was cool. I met people, interesting people, friends in that industry and learned a lot about what each of them do. I met um, graphic designers, stationary people. Um, I have a great friend who owns Cleveland Music Group. Shout out. Um, amazing company. They arrange um, music for events and things like that. And What's their incredible. name? Incredible. Cleveland Music Group. Okay incredible um just making sure everybody heard yeah 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 thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good friends so yeah I, learning from all of those different bus business owners and learning from um what they do was also super valuable and kind of showed me okay i can do anything i want you know and again what's next uh, is always my um is always my is always my thing so eventually once the kids you know my i had four um you get to a point where you say, okay, yeah, I'm doing this, but. Well, how did we get I, to four? Hold on. We were oh, on yeah, one. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sure, sure, sure. Sorry. Oh, no, Sorry. Good, one, well, one just kind of turned into four, you know, it just they, kept, they it just, just kept you rolling. add a little bit of water and they yeah, just you just it, they just grew like plants. Um, yeah, no, it, it, there was no, I would say that period of my life with, uh, with, with children and babies is, is such, you're so, fo there is no more you, you know? It's taking care of those children turned into my entire life, Monday through Friday, at Sunday, actually 24 hours a day, every right. day. Um, so really, it was kids? like a blur, I feel like. It was just kids, photography, kids, 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 photography, you know, the whole time. My kids now are um, six, about to be seven, okay. um, nine, ten, and just turned 13. My oldest, just a teenager. Okay. So... Um, yeah, they're they're incredible, incredible kids. But I'll say, you know, when you're in the midst of babies, um, you know, it it just really flies. It flies. I'm impressed on yeah. how you would juggle that. You're you're a single mother now, right? I am now. Then I had a lot of support. I uh, to his credit, my my um, my ex husband, you know, he worked as an architect. We met in school. Okay. Um, and so he worked during the days. I took care of the kids. And then on the weekends, I worked. You know, it, kind of, it, was, it was a balance. And it was something we did together um, at the time. And, um, you know, it, it, like I said, I was, I was very fortunate to be able to learn, you know, have a small intro into what owning a business is. And it was a perfect small intro because it wasn't full time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't high risk, right? You invest in equipment, you invest in time, but you really can't lose anything. I mean, like at you, that point, you're not managing a staff, right? You, you have you, no one right? under you who yeah. you're feeling accountable for other than your children, your family, where sure. you're, you know, you want to provide and, and everything. But this was a perfect intro into, you know, into this w w without you know, kind of like mitigating the fear that comes with jumping into owning a business. So it was it was an ideal beginning um to that but again after the fourth kid you say this isn't enough now i've got i've got four kids to support here now and again you know what what can i do now is kind of is kind of where i eventually got with that and is is that where you pivoted into franchises pretty much I, there was a, a slight overlap where um um the, the way i got introed into franchising is through um, um, a very imp important person in my life who's my cousin, um, otherwise known as the Donut King of Nebraska. Okay. He is a Duncan franchisee. And prior to me opening my own company... Duncan uh, has an incredible culture. Oh, my Every gosh, I'll tell you. They're fanatics about the brand. They are. And I've met the most interesting uh, and influential people 
who are Duncan franchisees. I really have. Um, but how I got introduced to franchising was Bryce had brought me to MUFC, which is multi-unit franchisee convention mm -hmm. in Las Vegas, probably two years prior to me starting my own company. And when I when I got there and he brought me around, he looked at me and he said he knows me better than anyone on earth, like a brother to me. And he looked at me and he said, you, you can do this. This you were meant you were built for this, you know. And as I spent the you know three short days there with him going, meeting all these people, do you know that feeling you get when you these are my people? Mm -hmm. These are my people. I instantly felt. You know, comfort. I can resonate with it. I I just started doing the IFA events this year, or well, twenty twenty three. First one I went to was DC. I oh, met that was you. yeah, um, yeah. And I, you know, I met Tom, another guest on the show recently. Yeah, and finding other people that are really passionate about helping other people and growing a business is kind of rare. I've, I've been in corporate America, and it's a different vibe than it is in the franchise side of things. Uh, the corporate owned companies are more private equity kind of the kind of douches, no offense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, it, it's it's so interesting because an outsider would look at us and say, You're you, you don't need to travel for your job. Do you really need to go to these things? You know? And and I've heard those things said. Mm -hmm. Like, do you really need to travel to Las Vegas? Like an outsider looks at it as worthless. But someone like you and I who have been to these things, it is absolutely priceless for learning how to grow and, and being influenced and having mentorship. The education to it, the, the networking potential, yeah. the, um, your sanity. So when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're on a freaking island. Absolutely. You Camaraderie, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't have, I don't have, I always tell people, I can't go to happy hour. There's nobody, I can't. Right. It's just me, you know, and, and to have that in business, to have those people who can relate to you. And what's interesting is the UPS store and Dunkin' Donuts are completely different franchises with completely different, um, different everything, right? But myself and my mentor, Bryce, we have the same job. Yep. We have the same problems. We have the same phone calls, the same complaints, the same wins, the same losses, you know, and, um, so to meet a bunch of Bryce's, you know, is like, oh, I have people here. Um, and, and I fell in love with the idea of becoming a franchisee at that convention. I went again the following year and not until the year after that um, did I start my company. So it took three years for you to pull the trigger. Yeah, yeah. it took three years two two of me kind of researching what franchise I wanted to. to I'm curious, why would you end up out with UPS then? You know, it wasn't it wasn't pre-planned and it wasn't something where I knew that's what was going to happen when I went into it. What happened was my f initial idea to do a franchise was I'm going to do something relating to kids because at the time that's what I knew. Mom of four, super super passionate about it. And I kept looking in my community and neighborhoods going, there's no good where are the good daycares? I started having all these ideas again, mm -hmm. like my creative mind kind of took over and said, why don't we have um, more nature-based learning? Why are things priced the way they are? Why can we not integrate the elderly and children in these facilities? Why, you know, and I started thinking I could do this. I could do this. And I, so much so that I went online and got another master's degree. Um, I got a master's of early childhood education in those two years. I went on online at night, every night, for like a year, uh, until I, a, a year and a half, until I got my master's of early childhood, which is now a coaster. <laughs> I don't use it. You um, still have it. I have it, and maybe someday, right? Um, but I didn't, this just goes to show, I did not know what I wanted to do. Um, the UPS store was, at the time, moving towards print. Mm -hmm. uh, and is still moving towards print as a profit center and trying to grow that, right? And when I saw the UPS store for sale, I thought, I know print, I know graphic design, I know photography, you know, I have a background in architecture, so I know plotters, mm -hmm. I know printing. And so my mind didn't go, 
I want to be a shipper. You know, that's my dream. <laughs> it went, not only do I know a bit about how they're trying to grow. Well, the stores aren't really, sh- and you can correct me because I don't run them, yeah, but yeah. Um, the stores aren't really a shipper. They're, they really just receive the packages and they're picked up. Correct. Right? I mean, yeah. for yep. the most part, the and again, you can correct me, but the profit centers there is stuff like the post boxes, um, the print side of things, mm-hmm. and then other services, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah. Top three, shipping is by far our number one. Right. The reason for that being, one, that we're just the best logistics company. Sure. UPS is the best logistics company there is. Two, we have um, a partnership, a commission with Amazon, right? And so now with the world post-COVID and all of these returns, um, that 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 really has upped our Amazon's fought with UPS center. quite a bit. I, we're going to end up off topic if I could push that too much, but yeah, I, <laughs> I know they go back and forth and like Amazon, but Amazon eventually did start you know their own delivery and everything, and I'm sure that impacts UPS quite a bit. But. Oh, I'm sure. I I don't know the ins and outs of the of that just because UPS store pays a UPS shipping bill, so we right. aren't the shipper, like you said. But um, it's still our number one profit center. Um. Mailboxes are great because it's a hundred percent profit. There's no, there's nothing going out other than labor um, to, you know, to distribute mail. But um, it's, it's, you know, really, really good profit center. But you know, at the time, it wasn't a dream of mine. You know, prior going, oh, this is what I've always dreamt of. But this was something I saw that felt, it felt like I could do this and I could be knowledgeable about. And also, it's safe. It's not. Someone had once given me the advice, do not invest in something sexy. Yeah, the UPS store, mm-hmm. well, eh, maybe it's a little sexy, but it's not, <laughs> right? No, not really. It's safe. It's something that people will always, always need. And Boring businesses are usually the more, you know, the safer bet for sure. Yeah. I, I'm in cleaning, you know, cleaning and painting services. It's, people need it. Yeah. It's yeah. never going away. Shipping's never going away. No. And, and. Uh, and the company, the 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 corporation is evolving, right? So we're doing we're 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 helping more with returns. We're doing different things to to you know kind of adapt to what society is now needing post COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, so, how was that, by the way? Oh so, God, I'm, yeah, I'm so sure glad you, you asked. Yeah, I'm sure you because got... if you're thinking of the timeline, I'm talking. Mm-hmm. I purchased my first store in December. Of 2019. Oh, right before. COVID hits hard March. I'm brand new. It was a disaster for me. Now, did I, it wasn't an outward disaster. I didn't crumble, but I'll tell you to be an essential. Did you start with all four stores or? Just one. No, I started with with my baby. Yep. And I only had the one location, but I'll tell you to be hit with that right off the bat was so intense, not only because I was a new business owner, but because we were essential business. We were an essential business. So there was no shutting down. There was no, and there were all these mandates that not everybody agreed with. And, and one time I'll tell you, I was, um, waited for at closing by a man, a very scary man who was upset that I had a mask mandate in the store and started presenting me with all these papers and he wanted me to look at them and he wanted me to, he said, I, you know, and it was, it was scary. I mean, there were, there were points as a business owner where you go, oh, I don't know. Do I need now? I now Do I need an armed guard to walk to my car? Right. Because I'm, you know, and so people were scared. There was so much fear in the air, especially yeah. those first few months. Right. Oh yeah. It was hard. And then, you know, you had the employees who have elderly people at home and they're saying, sorry. Um, at one point, I think it was just me and, um, me and one other woman, my manager at the time. And we stuck it through, but oof, it was it was something. It was something. But we got through it. You know, we we luckily as a franchisee at the time, part of the reason you become a franchisee is for that umbrella of support, mm-hmm. right? Of the corporate office. Well, I'll tell you what, during COVID, that was just such such a a savior for me personally. They knew I was new. There were so many guidelines that they gave. This is what we're going to do for this. This is what we're going to do for this. And that helped me a lot. Whereas if it were just me on my own trying to figure out how to navigate COVID, it would have been, it would have been bad. So were they giving you regular updates? Like I know uh, when I met with Tom, with Donato's, 
Yeah. Donato's. Mm-hmm. You got, got it. it again. Yeah. So, but when I met with him, <clears throat> he was saying he was doing daily updates across all the franchisees. Was UPS stored in? Oh yeah. Like that I too? mean, they were they were blasting us with anything they could. And at the time, I don't know if you remember, but. It, there were all kinds of each every state right had different mandates and different so at them as an umbrella having to deal with all these different states uh, they couldn't obviously tell me what exactly was going on sure. in ohio but um you know there were overall overarching guidelines like for instance like um plexiglass mm-hmm. plexiglass uh some places had to and, have the yeah barriers. you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this and and you know for me that was that was valuable because I wouldn't have known what to do. Yeah, I could have thrown up something, but they immediately made things available, you know, sanitizing stations. Here's this, a vendor that. for the series. Yeah, here's what you do. Here's a guideline. And and that was that was super helpful and part of the reason it's it's attractive to it's me. The value a in a franchise, right? Yeah. There. Yeah. And 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 it was it was a crazy, crazy, crazy time. Um and I'm still frankly, I'm still kind of unraveling the effects of that stuff. Um, mostly with staffing, not so much with I think everybody Physical. is, not just in business, in, in life in general, right? Like, yeah. I think the whole world became somewhat um, antisocial. Everybody yeah. has a, a little bit of uh, social anxiety these yeah. days. Uh, I mean, you take the whole population, you stuff them in the house, you shut down the economy. It's going to disrupt the world a little bit. Yeah. So. It's, it's been crazy. It's been do you remember when we were younger? I'm going to age us now. See, we were just having this conversation, yeah. not on camera. When we were younger, when you would write a resume, you learned how to write a resume in school. Mm-hmm. And which I don't know if that happens anymore. I didn't go to school. Or... <laughs> You'd never know it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and on the resume, you learned if you it's it was embarrassing to put something on the resume where you worked there less than a year. Right. It was you're like, don't even right. put it on there. Now, I mean, I'm telling you, you, you get resumes with 20, 30, 20, 30 jobs on it in the I, last we, two we years. We still pass on it. My managers talk about this all the time in our meetings, right? They do look at that still. I, I know some place, I don't think some of the younger managers see it the same way. Yeah. But, and my, my manager's relatively young. I think the average age is probably early 30s. Yeah. Um, they still consider that heavily and Ugh, job jumping. It's, it, it, it's a thing. Yeah, well, it's definitely a thing. It's a thing. And it, you know, uh, most recently I, I had a, a, a meeting, a manager meeting where I printed out, um, a payroll report that showed turnover rates, um, for each of my stores. Mm-hmm. And those heavily correlate with my store numbers, because if you, if you're a revolving door and you're getting new people all the time, it's impossible for that manager to completely train each new person to be perfect it's just Mm. not possible there's a learning curve and it's okay but if we're constantly fighting this revolving door you know we can't stabilize it's challenges yeah Yeah, you know they they, they could be overcome yeah i speed up training really that's kind of what we're looking at right like it takes yeah uh, one of our refinishing techs for example we don't expect them to really have the job hammered down for a year yeah so if we can get, if we can get that down to 6 months yeah it helps oh training is everything yeah. and and we're constantly trying to improve that what what new you know um opening closing sheets can we have what guidelines can we provide what what will help them understand all of these little tiny cuz in the UPS store there's just these little tiny details that you have to remember but there's a ton of them there's a ton of different things we do mm-hmm. notary you know AT&T you know um Amazon returns straight shipping mailbox it, it, there's all these little rules in each category and so it's 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 tough it's tough to come up with a system that works and that works well so but it's a constant struggle but again being a um a creative person um, who's in a box, right? Mm-hmm. That's 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 kind of the thing about people like that. It's they end up to be entrepreneurs sometimes, but they have to be creative within the constructs yeah. of the company um, to grow. And that's it's turned out to be for me kind of a good fit because you still can use your, you know, use those thoughts towards improving yourself rather than not using them at all, which I can't. I physically can't do it. Right. You know, you have you have to. You have to be able to say, what now, what now, what now? I get bored, you know? I get bored. 
Um, but yeah, I think I think COVID came was tough. Yeah, you were at your first store in COVID. But it didn't it didn't it didn't scare me off from wanting more. Um, which is a miracle. Uh, but it didn't scare me off. It just made me think, okay, um Well this, didn't you, this, I would imagine a UPS store actually would do pretty well through COVID. It, well, it did. It was just hard. It was just hard. Not that it wasn't hard for everyone. Um, but it was hard to it was hard to overcome it was hard to mitigate all the extra business with less people. Gotcha. So it was like, great. You know, we'll ship all the toilet paper to New York City. Yeah. Bring it in. But there's only two of us. So the problems became there's a line around the block because they had to be six foot from each other. And only two of us willing to be there and risk our lives. Because at the time, you know, it yeah. was everyone's going to die. Um, nobody knew anything. And so it was it. It was that struggle that was the most challenging. But I think 20, 2021, I purchased the next two at the same time. Um, it just so happened that one, a couple who owned two stores were retiring and had approached me and said, are you looking? And uh, I said, so yeah. So your first one, did you buy an existing that was already established? 30-year store. 30-year okay. store. It was extremely, extremely established. Um, the community, it's, it's, it's a part of that community. It was a mailboxes, et cetera, prior to being a UPS store. So this is an old, old store. So out um, of the four, did you open any of them from the ground level? None of them. Okay. That's maybe next. Okay. That's maybe next. We're, well, we're, I don't know if you would, right? Like, I mean, it, to me, it makes more sense to just buy the existing if you can. It's it's funny. It's a it's a it's a give and take, right? Buying existing has its huge advantages, which is, you know, kind of you can look at the P and Ls, you can look at the last three years, and you can kind of predict how it's going to do, whether right. you own it or someone else does. Unless you heavily drop the ball, you can figure it out. The advantage of building new, in my mind, and how I see it would be, it's a less, you know, there's less upfront cash needed because you're not paying for that mm -hmm. existing business, right? So it's a, it's a lower investment, but I really think you got to home run the location to do it. You, you got to home run the location. You got to be now positive. Now, does UPS help pick those or do you generally, are you responsible as a, a franchisee of selecting your location? So the UPS store has a list of of potential places they think would be good spots. And then it's up to you to kind of say, hey, um, you know, there's a there's uh, people in the company I can write and say, hey, I'm interested in opening a store, you know, here. And then they'll say whether or not that territory is taken also. Yeah. So they, they provide a lot of support with guidelines on that. You know, uh, we don't think this is a good spot or this spot is already owned by someone or think about your proximity and what, what you know, they, they're very, they want to make money. You know, of they want to make those. those well, they also have to so, honor their agreements with the territories. Right. With the other franchisees and be yeah. respectful. And they don't want to oversaturate the market either, you mm -hmm. know, which is a, a concern probably for a lot of businesses. But um, have not done that yet. All existing. The next two were um, owned by a couple. Um, and that was just an easy decision for me. I knew I wanted to grow. And then at that point, I kind of had the hang of the bank and the process and how to do this. And so I kind of um, jumped in and did that one. What was your biggest challenge going from one location to three location, like juggling the, you know, cycling your time through it? Yeah, that, that, that the biggest challenge was how to split myself in three. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really that challenge has been something I've worked on over the year, over the, you know, the past couple of years to kind of create a better structure for my own company right so you can choose to um you can choose to manage all of those managers alone or you can choose to hire someone to help you manage well, that's what i was just going to ask you is do, do you have a, a right hand right you know? i have a right hand and I, I now i have a right hand who's officially um who's officially a right hand before i was kind of growing her she actually was a manager of one of those no sorry she was an employee at one of those two stores when i purchased it so okay. And she's just, she's just, I have to say, I am nothing without my team. Nothing. I, I could never do all this alone. Um, and I have like an amazing team. Um, she is incredible, incredible, an incredible person. She came, you know, she grew up rougher. She grew up with um, taking care of her family. She grew up with a lot of responsibility. Uh, and she, rough relative to me, 
you know, rough relative to me, I should say. But uh, she is an incredibly fast learner, bright, and just needed kind of that opportunity. And she has flown. And I, I knew that she would, but she's just flown. So, um, but that's with four, you know, with yeah. three, I didn't do that yet. I kind of was okay. But I feel like there's this thing called the death zone where you own four and either you are split too thin and your mental health suffers mm -hmm. or you grow and hire someone. So I'm at that point where I'm in between, right? I'm at four. I can't do, I can't do it all by myself, but I'm not really at the point where I feel super great having a district manager, right? For my stores. But it's almost like, do you want to take the hit to have a better lifestyle? Kind of a kind of a decision that I've made. I, I've, I so I never struggled with this. Um, yeah. I I literally will just put it all back in, put it all back in, put it. And I, but I understand people can't always do that. Like you have four children to take care of, and yep. you're in a different situation, right? Yeah, I'm single, no kids. Yeah. I, I'll sell my house and live in a box. I don't care. The business <laughs> is more important to me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But you can't do that. So, you know, it's funny because I can't think of a circumstance where my business wouldn't be put first. It's hard, right? Because as a mom, my business, not only am I accountable for all of my employees who need a paycheck, I'm accountable for those kids. You know, I'm by myself. So if I if that business fails, they no longer have my support. So it's almost like one in the same, right? My kids come first, their health come first. If they're in the hospital, the store can die for all I care, right? No, no, no. Yeah, I but get that. But you have the expenses of the kids simultaneously. It's that balance. Right? Yeah. It's that balance. And 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 I would argue, you know, that the balance is kind of a myth, right? You have to kind of embrace the imbalance. Oh, I I hate the phrase work life balance. I try to provide it for my staff. Yeah. But if you're an entrepreneur, there is no work-life balance. It, it, it's it, you you end up living for your work. Um and that's okay, right? Yeah. And you do it for the people that you work with and everything, but you have to be willing to it takes a certain person to do that. Absolutely. Right? They have to have the bug. Um if they don't, they won't. Yeah. But, and everybody's life everybody's life is different like you said. Right. Some people have different circumstances than others. For me, uh, when I have my kids, I'm with those kids, and and it's four kids. It's not one kid. It's a lot of kids. So, well, the teenager you don't have energy, to worry about, right? And, oh yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the problems change. You know, yeah. the problems change. It, it, the struggles and the and the challenges, I should say, change. Um, the love only grows, but the challenges change. But I would say that the balance is a myth. It's almost like embrace the imbalance embrace friction because you you can't have it all you can't have it all you know you can't run a perfect company and be a perfect mom and be a perfect everything it's a total myth so the, you, do you have you tips have, for the you know the mothers out there that are thinking about going to be a franchise owner or a business owner and how they're going to balance those things i do i have i have a lot of tips one tip would be to make make lists of your goals Make lists of your goals and write them down. Write them down because oftentimes women, we get so wrapped up in in that idea of being perfect, um, you know, and the expectations are so heavy. They're so heavy. Be the perfect mother. Go to the field trip. Uh, our parents are getting older. Who's going to care for, for our elderly parents? Laundry, dishes, um, um, be a badass at work, you know. It's impossible to meet these expectations. So I think my advice would be having clear goals for you, goals that can support everyone else in your family, everyone else in your life, but goals for you and write them down. Because once you have those listed, it's easier to say, I'm going to attain this. I'm going to attain this. And, and it's easier to have mental timelines and believe in yourself and believe that this is what's next, you know? It's easy to stay stagnant. It's easy to get stuck. Um, I'm sure for everybody, but in my personal experience as a woman, I feel like that's a small, small thing that any woman can do that makes a big difference. It makes. I a think big that difference. translates really to anyone, not just women, right? Yeah, 
I think that's fantastic advice for anybody in general. Screw everybody else. Uh, establish what's important to you and yep. focus on those things. And that's all that matters. It's your life. You get one. You um, have to. You yeah. have to. And and me, it, it, somebody once told me, and, and I, w- I was guilty of when I was a mother, I was guilty of putting my kids above everything. Because what that did is I didn't take care of myself. So those kids need a mom who has energy or who is slightly caring for herself because if not they're worse off so yeah. it's kind of a, a you know it's the same concept you know you've you've got to kind of focus on your goals and what you want to do um and then most importantly do it you know do it take take leaps take jumps you know it's it's just part of being it's part of being an entrepreneur is taking leaps and jumps and going for it. If you don't, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. Now, you've had the wait, you've had the UPS stores how many years? Four. So you grew fast, by the way. Quickly. So you're, yeah, you're buying a unit a year. Yeah. How did, again, because I think, oh, buying something new, you, I, I know this because I've started new things. Um, it literally is every waking moment, you know, at mm-hmm. least the initial period, the yeah. first six months at minimum. Yeah. Um, how did you work this out with your kids? Did you set them all down and have a conversation with them and like, hey, mom's <laughs> not going to be here for six months. Uh, you guys are going to see me in passing at midnight. You know, no, I think I think by the time I bought my fourth, which was this this pa- a year ago. OK, mm-hmm. um, first of all, it helps that the fourth store is in my hometown of Pepper Pike, where I live. So mm-hmm. the the fourth store is two minutes from my home, which is super helpful. but. Secondly, at that point, I had established myself to have three stores that are running super well. So it's almost like if you can get to the point where your training and your hard work and your teamwork has made a team that's confident and who can kind of run those stores, you can kind of focus all your energy on the new one and getting that. Well, you know, sure, but I, no, I'm talking about your first location. Oh, the first store. Yeah, the very first one you bought. I know it's already operational and yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Again, you got that excitement. You, you, you're really pumped. It's you know a new thing for you. It's the first one. Everybody gets that. They get to the, They just end up diving in. Oh yeah. No, that was that was um, another important lesson in my life that that I learned that I hadn't learned prior while being a stay at home mom, which is you need to ask for help. You need to ask for help. Now, it takes a village. Do you have family that helps you? Yeah, Big mom, time. My mom, parents dad. are yeah. so, so supportive. And and without them and without their support through me opening all of these companies, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I wouldn't have been able to do it. But they, anytime I needed, you know, evening help, daytime help, because the majority of the time, you know, I had people work during the day, yeah. you know, so, so, and not all of mine were in school. At the time. So my parents and I'll say this, too. I don't know about um, any other listeners who had young kids during covid, but my parents drove an hour every single day from Youngstown to teach my children who had to be remote taught. During those months while I'm opening my store, so not only am I opening a store and not home, I'm not home with them having to remote learn. So I had parents who sacrificed every single day, hour up, hour back during COVID, mind you, and they're in their you know Mom late and late sixties. Free the shipping for life. <laughs> free shipping for life for <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, so yeah, they uh, incredible what they did for me. Incredible. I wrote them a, 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 after I, I couldn't. I, you can't. How do you thank someone for that? How do you thank someone? And and when I did try to thank them, their response was. Are you kidding? That time was absolutely priceless. You know, we got to spend every day teaching, helping our grandkids learn and being there every day. And that's just the response of good people. You know, they, they were selfless and they're the reason I, I don't know what I would have done. It's important to have that circle. Yeah. Huge. I, I had my dad early on. He, he helped with the business answering phones, anything he could right before I could afford to hire staff because yeah. I bootstrapped mine. I didn't do a loan. Um, the company was started with a credit card and a pickup truck. Crazy. Yeah. I it, love that. Badass. So, <laughs> hard. Uh, the banks won't touch you for three years. Right. So yeah. you have absolutely no capital, so, yeah. but there's that in between period where it's, 
I'm technician. I'm I'm office staff. I'm literally every job. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it would have been extreme. It would have been so much harder without my dad at least helping with the phone calls here and there. He couldn't put them in the computer, but he could take them and write them down and let me put them in later. Right. I mean, I I don't know what entrepreneurs would do without support, and support comes in different ways for different entrepreneurs, right? Sure. So, uh, you know, different people need need different types of help, but. That's the answer to that question is without those people, I couldn't have done it. That was just a crazy, crazy time with that remote learn stuff. My gosh, you know, and I had sat in, you know, the worst. I try to bite my tongue when we talk about the COVID <laughs> stuff because I have my opinions about that situation and, and it angers me. I, I don't get upset and angry about much, but yeah. that whole situation and the way it was handled and everything, it just. It's very frustrating because we're still dealing with the ramifications of it and, uh, oh. and the impact of it today. Yeah. And it, it really hurt this country as a whole. I'll tell you what. I was home one day and my mom was sitting with my son on the remote learning. And there was the laptop sitting there and he's pointing to a letter. No, the teacher's pointing to a letter, but the sound is off. So her finger's on the B and she's going like, she's going like, you know, A, and it's on the B, and then my son's going, you know, he's going, uh, 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 you know, because here, you know what I mean? It yeah. was, it was, I remember watching that thing, and uh-oh, <laughs> it's like kindergarten reading age, and I'm like, this is not going to go no. well. This is bad. It was, it was pretty scary, but, you know, again, they, you know, we made it through, but, oh, glad that will never happen again in our life. I don't lifetime. even know, see, that's what I'm saying. I don't even know if we <laughs> could say we made it through yet. Uh, well, yeah, it's still, we're still... We're still seeing the effects of it for sure. Um, we're, we're four years later, and this uh, the impact is still impacting businesses yeah. left and right, right? Um, the inflation that was caused, not just because of that, but that, that played a huge factor in it was the stimulus printing, uh, shutting down. I mean, you shut down the economy, it's going to mess things up. Yeah. And that's not causing everything that's happening today, but it's causing... A lot of problems with staffing. You, you're talking about staffing right now yeah. and how you're having a hard time and your turnover is higher and everything. Why is that? Oh, it's because people can't afford to live on the wages yet. We can't just arbitrarily raise prices in every industry across the board. Right. You know, I'm in, a, I'm in an area where I'm not able to do that as quickly. So what used to be a really good paying job now has become an okay paying job mm -hmm. and you know and that trickles all the way down to again fast food workers you know you got yeah. the stuff where they're getting 15 20 dollars an hour now yeah and then the middle trades aren't going up as quickly these this is all impacts from that period like yeah. that was the trigger event that triggered this stuff and it's causing all sorts of problems for business owners that they're, they're having a ha hard time navigating it because it's getting more difficult to get staff uh, morale we talk about morale in a company right uh there's morale in a country too yeah and the morale in this country is crap right now yeah you know when it comes to the the average worker and the average person getting a job and we're, there's not a lot of optimism for the future and that's really impacting it. And then that's making it very difficult for us as business owners to help grow, which will help with the optimism. But it, it, we're, we're between a rock and a hard, hard place right now. It's a struggle. And when, yeah. I, when I talk to, um, you know, my colleagues and, and, and all the people, you know, all the Duncan guys and all the other, other franchises, it's kind of like, you know, when is there, is there any coming out from this staff stuff? Or is it a cultural change that we must now adapt to? Now, frankly, I have purchased um, self-serve kiosks in all my stores because mm -hmm. it's to the point where this is a permanent, you know, this may be a permanent thing and maybe we have to automate more. And that's why oh, that's all of these sure stores are just automate, 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 because you know what? It's, it's efficient. Sometimes the people being less social now prefer to go to my kiosk than talk to anybody at my counter. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to do my return, you know, and that's becoming kind of a, a change in culture where we don't want to talk to people. We want to go to the machine, you know, but my my kiosk in one of my stores is doing 30 percent of my Amazon returns, 30 percent. 
So oh, I believe it. For me to look at that, I go, that's great. That's great because I struggle to find staff. So if this machine is is doing a lot of that mundane work and, you know, taking it off my staff and making that their day less stressful where they can mitigate their line and then say, go to the kiosk. It's not it. preventable. Us as business owners, we're going to have to implement this stuff. Yeah. Right. It, otherwise, we'll die. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have to adjust with it. it but. I had a long conversation with one of my consultants the other day, and it it was not consulting. It was just a late night conversation about the future of the the country. And when we start talking about robotics and everything, it the the advancements with AI and robotics and everywhere that we're going, it leaves these massive question marks right now. Um, Because they're great for businesses, you know, at, at least initially. So, like, I own a service business. When I can get robots that are going to go out and do some of the work, eventually they'll, you know, they're going to alleviate some pressure from the staff. But the reality is is they're going to replace the staff. I can't lie about it. I can't sit here and say I don't know that's that's a reality. That's going to happen. Yeah. But how the country navigates this is really just who knows. Who knows? I know. the, The scary part about it is we don't know who's leading the conversation. Yeah. No, you're right. It's 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 very interesting though. I I love to follow it. I love to learn about what companies are doing what with with automation because it really is it is it is the future. And so it's fun to watch, but it's also very scary to watch mm-hmm. because you you're thinking constantly about your own company and how is this going to change your structure and how is this going to um change attitudes and all of those things. But um Certainly a small step towards that for me was buying those, you know, investing in those kiosks to kind of see, okay, let's take a tiny little, let's take a little step to see what it does. And it's turning out to be, you know, great. It's turning out to be great for, for, for my company. Um, But it's kind of cool to have the opportunity to do those things. And that, again, that's a, that's made possible by the franchise who's coming up with these new things. Um, I look forward to seeing an app someday or something um UPS doesn't have an app. well ups does but ups store okay. um and maybe that's why i'm not really sure i just would love to see that someday and i'm i'm hoping that they're moving that i direction. normally try to stay on positive things but i do yeah. use ups store occasionally for business uh-huh. right? uh-oh. Um, uh-oh. <laughs> the online printing functionality is kind of clunky yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They could really improve that. I mean, it, they need to, I don't know, partner with Canva or something. So much, um, so much room for us there. It's yeah. it's interesting because a ton of their, there are several stores in this country who kill it, kill it in print. Um, and so for me, it's about finding those people and asking them a lot of how questions. How they're doing it. Yeah. yeah, because you know what? It's, I want to get there. I want to get there. There's, a, there's an incredible opportunity there um, for for revenue um, and also for just creativity and fun. You know, it's just a fun it's a fun thing for me to do, and it's fun for people to do it. it you know, you get to ha- come up with different um, design concepts and get to interact with people more a little bit more. Adding um, design services would be interesting if you guys had a. Um, now we're just brainstorming. This is what business people do, but. Um, if you guys could figure out a way to tap into freelancers and everything to do design we have work, it. do you really? We have it. Oh, okay. It's just no one knows that. And so I didn't know. It's my responsibility to kind of change that in my own yeah. in my own company. So that's kind of on the docket. Especially we go through peak our peak season is like November, December, January. And then after January, you can kind of start working on those things. Whereas like there's literally we can't do anything else other than process packages for three months. Cause after after the holiday season comes return yep. return season and that's what all of january has been inundated with amazon 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 you know returns um or prepaid returns and all that stuff so the staff is just you know kind of wrestling with that right now so but yeah once i bought the fourth one that's kind of led us to kind of present day it's been a year since i bought that one so i'm due i'm due we'll see um i don't know i'm 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 kind of torn on what's next, but right now my newest things have been like figuring out fun fun things to do within my company to make everybody happier, 
little improvements I can make or also little things I can give. Um, for instance, we have, um, you know, lost packages where after so many days they're, they're kind of abandoned. Yeah. And after they're abandoned, I want to, um, I've been researching a couple local women's shelters in the area where I'd like to kind of become kind of a regular donator of things because, you know, it's, it's about who can benefit from this stuff and how can we reduce waste and how can we help others? And that's just a small way, but it's something I'm thinking about is kind of partnering with them and establishing maybe a relationship where, Hey, are you, you know, does anybody want to come train or need a job? And, um, you know, trying to do things like that is kind of my next passion project. With Let me know who company. you get in with, because uh, I've thought about doing, you know, charity donations, some kind of volunteer work. I have a relatively decent sized staff, you know, we have 30 something people in the company. And I thought about like maybe helping at the food shelter, but ironically you email these charities and they don't get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, we are constantly looking for things like that, right? Because once you once you reach certain goals for yourself, well, then it becomes more important. You know what? What else can I do? You know, it's not all about. Well, it, it doesn't all have to be so technical. You know, some of this and some of some of running a company, some of being an entrepreneur. I think you you get it. It, it feeds your soul to do good things, and so I'm trying to find little ways to do good things as we work. Um, so that's kind of, kind of something I've been passionate about. Do you do stuff internally with your team? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the focus lately for me has been let, how do we boost morale? Um, how do we make everyone happier? How do we make it more fun? You know, those are, those are challenging things because at the UPS store, oftentimes when people come in, it's something's important, something, there's a deadline. Mm-hmm. I have to, you know, it's a high stress environment at times, right? Because the things that people are doing are important and they want you to know it's important. And, and sometimes those energies can transfer, you know, onto your staff. And so, so much intensity all day kind of wears them down. So we do fun little things. Sometimes we'll do like incentive games, like to make things fun or how many books of stamps can we, you know, silly things like that. Um, but mainly what I've been trying to improve recently is how how I can translate to my staff how we can do things better. Because it's one thing to have these quarterly meetings and it's just the same rigmarole every time. Do they really take it in? You know, are they really? No, they're glossed over. You can't expect them to care as much as you care. You can't. It's, 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 It's not a thing. So I've been doing this new thing recently that I think has been really cool where I take them to like a nice lunch we go out, at, you know, they, they staff the stores and they, they leave for lunch and we sit there and I give them all an open review. So they all see each other's numbers. They all see each Create other's turnover right? staff. Yeah. It's, it's about that, but it's also about what's he doing that I'm not? Why can he run his store, you know, with 170 hours a period and I can only do it. I can't, I can only do it in 200. You know, how... Why is he doing like, what is he doing? And like allowing them to converse about that has been a game changer with my staff because I don't feel like before they, I think like before they felt as individuals and now I'm, I'm trying to tell them, look, this is our team. Let's rely on each other. Let's play off each other's strengths. You know, I got one manager who's a graphic designer. So if my other one doesn't know how to design a logo, Feel free to call each other, you know? Right. And so it's this meshing of um, abilities between the managers and a little healthy competition. Can right? I make a suggestion? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, always. What we do, because I have four different divisions too, right? It's different manager heads for each one. We utilize Slack. And I don't know if you might want to check with UPS if you're allowed to or if there's any rules with that. But um, it's just internal communication for your company. A Slack channel is a really great way to do this. Um, you could do huddles in there, video conferences, all sorts of things, but it, are you familiar with it at all? Uh, we use home base, which okay. might be similar to Slack where it has like the internal messaging and things like that. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, it, it's, I'll look into it. I'm not familiar with home base. So I, yeah. I don't really know how to compare it to it, but 
it's really, really super convenient to have everything. And then when you guys are discussing things, you can organize it into threads really easy. Oh, that's cool. So that it all lives there and it's really easy to search. So oh, it's, nice. it's an awesome tool for internal communications like that. I'm going to look into that. And then like I, we do quote of the day in the mornings. We send it out, you know, stuff like that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Fun stuff. I'm yeah. always looking for suggestions like that because frankly, like I said, I mean, without them, I, we we don't have anything. So it's 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 something I, I like to constantly think about too. And then um the next thing is like thinking, do I do I wanna research commercial real estate and be my own landlord? Like that's the goal, right? You know, maybe buy a plaza, pop a UPS store in there and then and, and UPS. Commercial stores. real estate's nice. I'm it, telling you. Five year lease. Uh I'm I'm you don't I'm have to really, think about it. They build yeah. it out. No goals. Remodeling. Those are my goals. It's like, how can I? And and, and you know, I'm I'm kind of wanting to move in that direction because, frankly, to be my own landlord and also to have a store um, like the UPS store, which brings in the amount of foot traffic it does, mm-hmm. can make people want to be in that plaza too. You know, you start filling it up with good things, and and I have the ability to put one in there. You know who you should talk to about the commercial side is try to get in with, um, what's her name? I have I met her once. I met her in D.C. Uh, she's the VP for Marco's Pizza. Oh. But if you're not familiar with Marco's, Marco's had like a partnership with Family Video back in the day. Like really family what it is. Video. Yeah, yeah. Well, pizza and a, yeah, and yeah. a movie, right? Yeah. You know? Uh, it worked out well for them for a long time. That's why Ohio, by the way, anybody ever wondering why Ohio still had movie stores like a Blockbuster family video for so long? That's why. Because of Marcos? Because they're always <laughs> in the same plaza with the Marcos, but uh, apparently the, it's the plaza itself. It's the real estate. That's So they own all the real estate. Family Video did, right? Or the family that owns Family Video. Uh-huh. They own all the real estate, so they weren't making money on the video stores, but they didn't care. It was just occupied for the real estate value. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, I, I really. But Marcos was always attached with it. So if you can get in with them, maybe. Yeah. You, could, you have you know, a little, little yeah. pizza. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of my stores are next to little pizza shops. I've got two stores next to Bibby Bop, too. I don't know what's <laughs> going on with that. Is that um, the little donut thingies? Bibby or? Bop? No. It's like, it's, like a, it's like an Asian Chipotle. Oh. Don't know it. It's good. It's it's gluten free. Um, but it's it's good. But I don't know why those keep popping up by my stores other than they're 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 I don't know, they're exploding right now. But um it's something I'm really, really interested in going towards in the future is that commercial real estate piece where, you know, I can start it's a new thing. It's what's yeah. next, right? Like I I'm 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 not bored. I'm just thinking, you know? I'm thinking. And I'm intrigued by... Well, those are passive investments. Well, semi-passive investments, right? Once yeah. you find the deal and you lease it out, yeah, there's no... Ma- that if you're doing commercial. Uh, again, I, so I service property management companies, right? That's my primary business, but I work with multifamily. Yeah. Different world. Different you're dealing world. with clogged toilets and so on and so forth. Commercial, yeah. you already know this, but mostly telling for the audience. Right? When you do commercial real estate, at you don't improve the building usually unless maybe clean it up a little bit, but you don't really do much with it. You don't rehab it. it, it aside from the roof, the parking lot, that's about it. Um, the tenant comes in and they do the build out mm-hmm. and they invest the money in improving your piece of real estate. Um, and then they do all this stuff for you and yeah. then they're responsible to maintain it. They have to fix the clogged toilet, the HVAC unit, the, you know, in most leases. Yeah. So yeah. really you're just, Unless you need a roof. Yeah. You know, it's funny. After after paying rent at four different, you know, locations, mm-hmm. I'm at the point where I'm going, why am I not on the other side of this? Oh, I bought this building. Yeah. I, I mean, you have to. It was no-brainer. like a no-brainer. no-brainer. I, I started looking at renting and I was, I was like, are you fucking, are you kidding me? It, right. I'm handy. I, you know, I'm a contractor, right? Yep. I was like, that that makes absolutely no sense. Oh, you don't even I wouldn't even you don't even want to know how much. I mean, it is it's insane, the rent, but it's the dream to kind of figure that out. And so maybe I will, you know? Yeah, you why maybe not? I will. I just have to find the right spot and the right opportunity. But so far, I've been doing okay. I've been doing okay at it. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to 
attending um, both IFA and MUFC are coming up. And my favorite thing about that is hearing what other people are doing and hearing what is trending and hearing um, about the reasons different people get into different things. And it's just, I just love every second of it. I love going there and learning all this stuff. Have you done this particular convention? Yes. Okay. I yes. haven't been to this one before. This will be my first. Yes. This one last year was in Vegas. So this is um, a much welcomed change. I'm, I'm very, very sick of Las Vegas. It was so funny. A UPS store sent out a little survey. Where would you like to have your convention? You know, and I'm picking, you know, I'm picking like Austin or like, you know, and, and of Austin course, cool. everyone voted Vegas. You know, I'm like, gosh, darn it. Now I got to go. To I don't Vegas. know why they like Vegas either. Vegas is. Eh. I think it's, the it's convenient. It's cheap flight. It's convenient from the airport, what, like 10 minutes from the airport. You know, I don't know why I, either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Escaping reality, maybe. I don't know. I think that's more in it. Yeah. So a lot of the people I'm talking to that are going, you know, it's like, they're not really going for the convention. They're going to cut loose and get away from the family and have some, not all of them, of course, but yeah. a lot of them are. What's interesting about that and about you saying that is I really do think, granted, the workshops they do are valuable. I'm not sure. saying they're not. What I'm saying is the most valuable thing that comes out of these conventions is the networking yeah it's the learning it's the social aspect of these things that's truly the most valuable it's the stuff that it's the stuff that that keeps on giving when you leave um you know more more so than the classes can i think um but it's it's for me it's impacted me quite a bit i mean with the people i've met and and now i've formed relationships where i know the people at ifa mm -hmm. i know so many people just because i've been going for yep. seven years did they and it's get, so did weird they get you on the women's committee i know they were like trying to recruit no you. because i lost her card she oh. gave me a physical business card and i had been she's handing... the one with that insurance company i'll get it for you because she, she awesome. got me i'm on the membership committee now yeah. thanks to her she got me introduced and so no. yeah but send yeah, me her because yeah. what happened was we were giving all the senators our our card and i think i accidentally gave him her card yeah because she had given it to me and i said oh no they're not going to use them anyway yeah uh, right i don't know why they wanted those but um but what a cool experience that was i had never done that before i don't know if i would say cool i would say scary to see to see how yeah. it worked yeah, yeah i felt the same feeling I felt the same feeling when I when I got back, you know, my mom's asked me, how did it go? Tell me about it. And I was like, I did not know this is how it works. I you did look behind the know. curtain and it's like, yes, yeah, but it's uh, let's leave the curtain closed. First of all, Capitol Hill is actually a hill. Yeah. So don't wear heels, you know, ladies. <laughs> um, that was a mistake. But but yeah, I was it was shocking to me. But a funny story about that, though, is I had been at a different table because of all of my buddies from, you know, different states. I wasn't at the Ohio table, right? So I'm at that little session they had in the morning. Well, our first meeting was at 830 and the bus was leaving at 830. And all of a sudden we're like, uh oh, we better get over there. We took an Uber and I strutted into that meeting right when it started and all of you looked at me like like you could tell that everyone was like who is this because yeah. i wasn't yeah. at any of the you weren't at the pre-game or the in yeah yeah but i, I felt mean, like my perspective was actually in that first meeting i felt like i made a slight difference i, I could be wrong you 100 percent were probably the most valuable one there because it, we were all franchisors yeah and especially when we're talking left, right, whatever, when you're talking to the left leaning politicians, yeah. we're corporate. Yeah. Right. You know, we're, we're the corporate guy. They, they, they don't care about us, in other words. Yeah. But you are the small business owner in their eyes, even though I'm a small business owner too. But in, yeah. in their eyes, you can connect with them a little bit better. So having the franchisee perspective was really valuable. You I and feel I like, had solo yeah. ones and it no, played I off know. really well where it's like, <laughs> Okay, franchisee, franchisor. Yeah. My view, your view, right? Yeah. I think we tackled that pretty well. I just wish that the kid knew how to take notes and actually no, was I listening know. to anything we said. I know. 
I know. The one girl who we were with actually wrote the wrong acronyms down. Yeah. For the, <laughs> I was like, oh, boy, this isn't looking good for us here. Um, but yeah, it was just it was it was interesting to see how it worked. But then it was also kind of um, empowering whether or not they listened to us. It was kind of empowering to even be in that position or to even True. to even have the opportunity to talk to anybody was for me it was it was whoa you know it was big it was big and it was really really something i won't forget for sure i i will do it again you know i have to they... do it i think every year because of the committee thing so if you do get on the committee i, I think it's part of it really yeah i believe well be wrong. i just i maybe really they're just telling it. me that so i go yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, you're required. Um, I just really, I, I really fed off of that. I thought it was really, really fun. It was a quick trip, though. And at the time, there were all these storms and everything. And so my flights got canceled. I actually drove there, which was an easy drive. It was like six hours. It wasn't bad. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm down. You just volunteer me. Just volunteer me next time and I'll go. But well, it was. Well, I'm going to bug you for it. I'm gonna, I, by the way, I think that was the best event I went to. It was my first. And. I think it was the best one because of the the level of seniority of the people that go. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a lot of the committee people, and it's a lot of you know higher up in the IFA. Yeah. So we go to a convention, and it's you know there's what there's five thousand franchisors out there. Yeah. But these the ones that are at the DC one tended to be more established brand yeah oh for sure real leaders you know with uh, hundreds of thousands of units you know oh my gosh i was talking to I, you know i walked into the first day and you know they had like some food set out and you could go you know chat with everybody and i sat down next to this gentleman and was was eating and had a little conversation and he mentioned that he had uh, had some you know applebees and i said oh my my firstborn is made of half Applebee's, you know, and I was joking. I, I ate French onion soup when I was pregnant, you know, and and he's laughing and 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 um, what's your name? You exchange names, and he says, "I'm Greg." I said, "I'm Lauren," you know. We meet each other, and um, and we walk away, and 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 then we're at another event the next night or something, and he, "Hi, Lauren," you know, he said, "Hi, Lauren," and then walked away. And the group of people I was with was said, "How do you know him?" Turns out he's the largest franchisee in in the world. I had no idea. I had no idea. So it was, it's so amazing to be able to meet these people who have You had another so story when we were in DC that was similar where you ended up with all the Google executives. How the hell did that you do that wild. again? That was wild. So, okay. So um, the Duncan crew, my buddies, yeah. they had a private dinner, which to which I was not invited. Um, so, you know, I, whatever, lowly UPS yeah. store, you know, I was not invited. So, um, what happened was they were going to a dinner um, somewhere near the Conrad, right? I think it's called the Conrad. It had a, a really pretty kind of um, bar on like the third or fourth floor or something. And because they were right around the corner, and I didn't know anybody there. I just said, you know what? I'll meet you all after your dinner. Shoot me a text. I'm going to head over there. <laughs> And have dinner, right? Alone. Yeah. So I, I go up there and I sit at the bar and I order some food and I'm just sitting there. And this gentleman comes and sits next to me um, and he says, you know, may I sit here? I said, sure, no problem. We were just conversing and he seemed a little stressed. But, you know, I, I didn't say anything, just a friendly conversation. Um, and the more and more people who would come and say hello to him or talk, speak to him or sit down, I started to figure out that this this is someone he, this is somebody and these people are somebody somebody yeah. they were very just extremely well spoken well 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 dressed as if they had just been you know at some kind of event you know um, um and not a fun one you know like a stodgy one um and they they all looked very you know kind of stressed out and he asked me what company I work for and then I had said well what are you doing here and he said oh I'm I'm uh, my company is being sued and I have to depose or whatever. And I said, oh God, I'm so sorry. You know, that's awful. And we just kept going and going and going. And, and, and at the end I said, so what's your company? You know, he said, Google. And then I start looking around at the people kind of mentally banking, like, remember what these people look like? Cause I'm going to Google yeah. everyone after this. <laughs> so yeah. So it, it turned out to be, um, I think it's that big lawsuit about like monopoly or I don't, I don't know what the lawsuit was about, but it was a big deal. 
it was a big deal and they were all there for it. And apparently I met the whole Google executive team, <laughs> not in the best circumstances, but um, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. And I didn't know it at the time. Did really. you get phone numbers? You know, you can follow up oh, and no, emails. No, but he, <laughs> he knows where my UPS stores are. So there maybe he'll pop in one day. Yeah. You never know. Maybe hey. he's maybe, he you know, maybe he'll hook me up on Google search. <laughs> Maybe that's why we pop up number one. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was wild. That was wild. That was wild. And I kind of just left there without really, I just left there being happy for the experience. It's cool when you you get in rooms with people that are beyond where you're at. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's my, that's actually one of the main reasons I do this show. Yeah. I, th- I think it's very cool. Like I get to sit down with people that have been where I'm trying to go. Yeah. Uh, it's invaluable to hear from them and learn from them and what hopefully save me some of the pain that they had to go through, right? Oh, yeah. And I mean, these events that we go to, the IFA, the MUFC, these people who go there are no joke. These are true pros uh, at their field. And any any kind of guidance that I can squeegee out of them while I'm there in between the, you know, the dinners and the fun. And, it, and, and it's getting to know them as humans because sure. really even the, even the largest franchisee in the world is a super normal human, you know, and, and um, kind, you know, and, and humble and willing to talk to you about anything. I'm, sh- I'm pretty sure that any question I would have had for that guy, he would have been there to answer it. And, it's it's an incredible that's community. That's what we were talking about earlier. I mean, that's one of the differences between franchising and corp- not always, but w- between franchising and private corporations. Mm-hmm. I, I've just I've noticed that franchisees, franchisors, not all, of course, either. The, the, there's exceptions to everything, but the culture seems to be more inviting and friendly, and they're more humbled. I. You get into Wall Street, right? You get into the you know the private equity groups and stuff. Not necessarily as much. Yeah. Uh, it just that's what I love about franchising because the the whole model in order for you to be successful in it is you have to be really really good at supporting others. Yeah. That's the only way you win in franchising. Yeah. It's the only way you win. Yeah. And and uh, another another only way to win in franchising is to constantly try to be better. I, I I would argue that, you know, people always say, oh, it's passive, it's passive or whatever. I, I don't think it's possible to be completely passive. It's not possible. There, I don't it, think there's if, any investment that's passive. None, none. No. You have to you have to involve yourself in the company and there is no passive. You can work on ways to to give yourself a better lifestyle so, like what I do, like where I have help. Right. I have a team, you know, and I've hired a district manager to oversee. You know, I don't have to do that. I don't have to take that out of my bottom line. I could manage all four, but I'd never be home. I would never be home. And and that for me, it, you know, is is an easy, easy choice for me. You know, I, I'm able to go to field trips. I'm able to take my kids to all their doctor's appointments. I'm able to be at school at their parties. You know, I'm able to pick them up if they're sick at school. It's It's something that I've, you know, I've made for myself and the choice I've made for myself. Whereas you know, I could, can you do it all? No, is the bottom line. You just just can't do it all. And there are some sacrifices you have to make to, you know, to, to feel like you're doing enough. You're, you're always sacrificing something, whether it's a personal life event or something at work, it's someone isn't being given that attention, you know, and, and that's just something you have to embrace, embrace the friction, I guess, embrace the imbalance because balance isn't a thing. It's not no. a thing. And change is a regular thing. And change is a regular thing. It's like it's like the advice I'd give somebody if they were coming into this, if they were asking me what what is being a franchisee like or what what do you want to tell me about it? And I would say my advice and what I would want to say is your career will be a roller coaster. A roller coaster. And you have to adapt to enjoying that ride. Whether it's at the bottom of the hill or at the top of the hill, you have to enjoy both because th- there's no other choice. It's not going to be, a, it's a small world, you know? Yep. It's not going to be. And you have to be almost, 
you probably would find a correlation between personality types. Do you like this or do you like this? There's a correlation there. Entrepreneurs are like sure. this in life and in work. And that's just who they are. That's who they are. And it's that creative thing that they have. And, and gutsy, you know, gutsy and adventurous. And I think anybody who's an entrepreneur should be proud of that. Very, very proud. Because whether you succeed or fail, you went for it. You tried it. You know, you went for it. You took the risk and you tried it. And, you know, for the most part, it seems like. There's one sure way to know you're going to fail. Right. Don't if try. you don't do it. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and. I guess another thing I would say that I've learned or that someone told me at some point, well, it's a famous saying, right? The grass is, isn't always greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it, right? It's like you can't expect to excel if you aren't working. You, you can't expect to excel. So everybody has to, it's never going to be a coast. It's never going to be a coast. You know, it's always going to be a hill. You know, um, and that's that's probably the, the advice I'd give to a newbie. Love it. Like me. Yeah. <laughs> You're not that new anymore. Yeah, You're pushing four up years on still you. I still consider newbie. I'd still consider myself four newbie. years for stores. Yeah. That's impressive in and of itself. How many is that common in the UPS network? No. Right. No, 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 no. I would say that franchises differ in this way where the UPS store, um, they they really appreciate the mom pa model, right? Whereas there's stores like Dunkin' um, or other other franchises where it's encouraged for you to buy as many as humanly possible. You know, they bank on the operator. They bank, okay, this operator does well. I want him to have grow faster, faster, faster. Not the UPS store, ma and pa. I want you to take care, care for this store. Love it. This is your store. This is everything. And so to grow at the UPS store is a bit, a bit more challenging just because they aren't, I, I don't think they're huge fans of that type of model where you own 40, 50 units. So they're reluctant to grant additional locations? It, it becomes more challenging to, to, to acquire additional locations at the UPS store, yeah. I mean, I like the attention to detail and having, you know, the mom and pop thing and mm -hmm. looking at it from a franchisor's point of view, right? But at the same time, having less franchisees to manage within the network and UPS store doesn't really need to have, yeah, you know, it's mom and pop at the counter. It's confusing to me. Yeah. But that's because my experience prior to buying came from being mentored by a Duncan franchisee. So I... I learned about this stuff watching him, and I don't know what the largest Duncan franchise he has. I would say probably, what, I don't know, well over probably 50, whereas the UPS store largest, I, I, I would venture to guess, is way, way, way less. I've met one before who had maybe 14, but that was high, high, high. Well, you so, don't have to stick with UPS store either. There's lots of multi-unit right? people that have that cross brands. Yeah, Go buy a Duncan diversify. Too, right? Buy a Duncan, yeah. Oh, gosh. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I, I always have. A, I always see, you know, the folks, the sales folks over there are always like, Lauren, when you gonna like, yeah. they all know me. It's funny because I'm such a small fry. I'm a small fry. But because of these events, it's your personality. It doesn't match like it, the people I know doesn't it doesn't match. But it, it it's like thrilling for me to to be around these people all the time. It's it's thrilling. It really, really is. But they're always trying to get me to do something. Come get a Dunkin'. Come get this. Come get that. It's. Are you it's, allowed to own a Kinkos if they still exist? We we are Kinkos. We're trying to. Oh, be, they bought we, Kinkos. No, okay. they didn't. They didn't buy them, but we are supposed to be that. We're supposed to be that print store, right? So okay. I, I'm supposed to make us into Kinkos. Well, that's what I meant. I, I, Kinkos was a separate company, right? Yeah, Kinkos was. Well, Kinkos. Uh, I don't, I don't even know if they're around anymore. Maybe. I thought they were in like out. I thought they were in Office Max or Office one of the office yeah. stores at one point. I think a bunch of office stores do print. Everybody's trying to grab onto that. But I thought they had free standing stores at one point. I could be wrong. I think when I was a kid there was Kinkos. In yeah. college there was Kinkos. I don't know what happened to them. Hmm. I don't know what happened to them. All I know is that's what we're supposed to be doing right now. 
So the goal is, how do I get there? Which, you know, it's on the docket. It's coming. It'll happen eventually. It's just a tough thing to, it's a tough thing to build. Got to go out and prospect and, and, you know, talk to the people and show them what we do or else nobody knows. You know? Any, any tips there? How do you guys target that stuff? Uh, do you guys keep a client database and reach out? So I use a local UPS store and they've never contacted me. No, well, we should do that. Um, I'm always, always trying to think of our, our current plan right now is to make a little folder full of samplers of different things that we do, a business card, a flyer, a, you know, pictures of um, tent stands we can do, all kinds of stuff, making a little welcome packet mm -hmm. and then taking those. Um, I, I would love to target schools, um, take one over to Cleveland Clinic. You know, oh, schools would be great if you could get a contract just doing some of their materials. Big time. They they need all the things that we do. Um, and you know, being especially for the Pepper Pike store, being do, local uh, promotional materials. Oh yeah, not, not just flyers and stuff though. Like, uh, oh yeah, everything. We do everything. Really? We've done at my store. We've done um, a tent. You know, a tent for like a a sports team. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, we've done tents. We've done. Um, Everything you can imagine we do. Cups, pens, anything. Anything. Are you Name doing tag. trade shows? No, I, you know, we don't. We don't do any of that. And, and You should join the uh, the Apartment Association for Northern Ohio Apartment Association. Do their trade show at least. You pick up a couple properties for their print materials and yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's not a bad idea yeah. to get into trade shows or something like that. I'm sure that. you could actually just team it with other franchise owners. I don't know. I, you, you, know not, yeah, you guys figure it, it out. And that's the stuff, that's the stuff that we need to get to. The challenge is how do we step away from the line mm -hmm. out the door, you know? And it's, and it's almost like what we, what we're focusing on doing is setting aside that time. Okay. On Wednesday, you know, I'm going to double up staff at this hours. I'm going to go prospect. And that's the type of thing that we're currently kind of working on. So it's kind of, um, prospect time, you know, it's yeah. prospect time. And then. Once we kind of start doing the small sampler folders, then we'll, maybe we'll think about stuff like that. Trade shows are a great idea. Yeah, that they're, they're not very expensive locally. Those anyway. So yeah. like the memberships, I don't don't quote me, but like six hundred dollars a year. It's super cheap. Yeah. And then the trade shows about the same for a booth. Yeah. So it's and you obviously get a deal on the print materials to hand out. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Super deal. Same deal as shipping. Yeah. <laughs> There, there, there's a handful of other people that do, you know, the print stuff there, but like yeah. Fast Signs is there a lot. Yeah, Fast Signs, who I met the CEO of at IFA. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, the connections, you know, and, and she was just such a cool person, just such a lovely lady. Um, and so I hope to see her in Phoenix. It's it's like, who's going to be there? Who I met? You know, I don't know. And I tried to put on LinkedIn that I'd be there to see who would respond. Um, but, you know. Not everybody. I get Not everybody. horrible engagement because I'm I'm like an oddball. So, yeah. Why? What do you mean? I, I I'm an oddball. You're a podcaster. I know that makes me an oddball. <laughs> LinkedIn's for professionals, right? I never I've never been good with the professional vibe. Well, um, that's not a lot of a lot of people aren't good at that vibe. I don't do the corporate thing. It, it yeah. it's raw Adam all the time. Well, you're so. coming to IFA. That's pretty corporate. I, I have to. I have to. <laughs> You're on the committee now. Yeah. You have to go. I have to do this stuff. Well, it's, it honestly is so fun. And and you've never been to this one. So this is going to be different. This is, um, it's not like DC. It's a little more loose and a little more social networking This focused. one struck me as more social yeah. hangout. Yeah. Um, that there's not even a lot of like lessons. There, there's extra paid trainings and stuff. Yeah. But there's not a lot of round tables and stuff like no. that. So it's not like the emerging either. I went to that one too. Uh, no. This one is this one is really, really good for networking. And um I just I just find it so so valuable. Plus my brother lives in Phoenix, so I'll get to make a little family, you know. Little I'm making a trip. whole trip out of it because I gotta drive to haul all this equipment. Oh, you're you're I'm driving oh, yep. to Phoenix? Yeah. I, I like being on the road. So, oh my god! Well, I'm, I'm I'm making a whole thing out of it. So I got a suite, and we're going to be doing podcast interviews for three of the days. I'm there. Yeah, try and knock out a whole bunch of interviews. Um, but then I'm I lived in Denver for a little while. My best friends live in Denver. 
So that's not too far. So I figured I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a two week event. Oh and, man, you're mean driving. Yeah. Uh, a, a story about that. I I do not condone this by any means. Okay, I'm I'm not promoting unsafe things. But once in college, I drove straight through from Phoenix to Youngstown. Oh hell no! That's like twenty six hours. True story. True story, straight through. By the end, I was, I, it was so irresponsible because I was hallucinating. Yeah, you could have killed yourself. He was hallucinating. I had a, a friend with me and my mom had told me, you don't you, meanwhile, she did not know I was going straight through, but she was like, don't let anyone drive your car. They're not insured. They're not insured. And so she'd be like, can I take over? And I was like, no, I can't. Mom said I, I can't. Can. My mom, <laughs> yeah, my mom said I can't. And, and we were, what happened was it wasn't, like a reckless thing we did on purpose, but we were two girls alone driving through the middle of Texas and we didn't want to stop. Like, let's not stop. It's too scary. We just kept driving. Um, but anyway, yeah, don't do that. No. Don't do that. Make sure I got you... three days planned on the way out. Yeah, right, make um... sure you stop. St. Louis, Amarillo. I think yeah. those were my two, my two stops. I right. hate Illinois. So I grew up in Illinois and I despise that state. So I'm going to try to just fly right through there. Yeah. Just pedal to the metal through Illinois. I hate that state. Oh, man. I hope no Illinois fans are listening. I I love the city of (laughs) Chicago, like the actual city. But that state is a disaster. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. As you were talking about COVID earlier, right? So wild story. I rode my motorcycle from here to Flathead Lake, Montana Uh. um, during COVID, the height of COVID. So you were talking about differences in states? Yeah. I had different experiences all the way across the country, and I had to stay one night in Illinois. I couldn't even get dinner. I couldn't eat <laughs> for the evening. Like, they were so bad yeah. with their lockdowns. I, I There was nowhere for me to get food. I couldn't do drive through on the bike. Like, they wouldn't, they, they it, wouldn't, they do, wouldn't it. do it. Oh, man. Because I'm too close, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, that was, it was a nightmare. Down. Um, but that experience was very interesting because I went through like South Dakota, which oh, was yeah. one of the one of the states that was just like, eh, we're not doing shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you had, yeah, so just experiencing a state to state was very interesting during yeah. that Comparing period. Comparing who was doing, what restrictions yeah. were where. You know, yeah. like two hours, you know, at this spot here, I'm getting cussed out and chased out of a gas station because I didn't put my mask on, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I go two hours, and now I'm in a new state, and then everybody's just Everything's hugging different. each other and whatever. That's interesting. Right? Yeah. You're probably one of the few who was, who was brave enough to be riding state to state at that point. I, I'm sure there's a lot of van lifers and stuff that That's were just- true. Van lifers. You know, yeah. uh, and, and retirees. Yeah. You know, they would just hit the road with their RV and was like, I'm going wherever they're cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was recently in at Whitefish. And um, there's a UPS store, oh, several of them, but there's a UPS store there. And, you know, it's like everywhere you go, you know, when you're a franchisee, you're always kind of t- taking that extra peek yeah. and, oh, how's that, you know, that store's doing, you know, it's, it just doesn't stop. You're always kind of looking, watching. I should have stopped in. I didn't do it. I didn't stop in, but. You should have went and said hi. I should have done that. But, you know, the skiing, skiing was calling. By one calling. stamp. Just By one stamp. <laughs> 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 the one thing I don't need to ever buy again is stamps. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been a wild ride so far. Hope it uh, hope it continues. I know it will continue, but I'm hoping to, like you said, like diversifying would be really great to experience some different, maybe a different franchise, maybe you know. And this is all dependent on how much can I grow with this. You know, if I'm if I'm done growing, or if I can't grow anymore, or if I'm told no, then you know I got to grow in other ways. Like, yeah, I mean, like a, I'm not, I'm not going to pry into the specifics on camera or anything about yeah. it, but like, yeah, yeah, if the margins are there, if not, find something else and yeah. add bigger. We'll margins. talk later. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk later about those challenges. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. It's just, uh, it's just, you know, what's next? You know, the goals never, the goals never stop for me. I would get bored. You know, um, I don't know that I could have ever done a regular desk job, even when I did a desk job. I knew it wasn't for me in so many ways. And one of the ways was I was absolutely terrible. I was absolutely terrible at what I was supposed to be doing, which made companies kind of maneuver me into what's called business development. Mm. So they would move me into um, the department where proposals are written and they're arranging kind of layouts for different um, um, sales, you know, sales documents or 
I'm doing Photoshop to present. And, and so I was being moved into the things I was good at. And that was one of the first signs where I knew, I think I'm a business person. I don't think I'm an architect, you know? It's so many things about that job showed me how, how not how not perfect for me it was. I think you've already proven that again. I had four franchise locations in four years. Yeah, it's quick. It, it, yeah, you're, you're, you're a business person. I'm a business. I, it's official. Mm -hmm. Give me the stamp. Business yeah. person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 I guess it's pretty evident. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Um, I Honestly, I think this has been an awesome time. I, I'm happy to continue going, but I don't think we can get anything else out of you. No. Um, You've heard my life story yeah, at this point. <laughs> yeah. I, I loved it. It's an impressive story. Hopefully they're not all asleep. No, right? I'm sure they're fine. <laughs> we'll edit out all our pauses and boring. Yeah, let's edit out, all, all, the, yeah. All, let's edit out all your swears that you yeah. were saying. What? I don't <laughs> fucking swear. I told you that. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this has been great. I can't wait to wear my beanie. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to share? Anything you want to wrap into the episode? Otherwise, we're good. No, I think I'll see you in Phoenix. Okay. And we'll do a live. Uh, we'll do a live podcast later, right? We'll do our live whenever you start doing live. When I'm ready, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whenever, whenever that comes about. I got to get enough followers on TikTok. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a struggle. It is. That's a struggle. I could buy them. The problem with that, though, is that I, I'm not doing it for the number of followers. I'm doing it for the right followers. Yeah, you right? need the organic reach. Yeah. That's what you need. So, yeah. I, I can go out there and I can just promote videos and make a catchy video that'll yeah. grab attention, but it's not the number of followers I have. It's the, the followers that are actually interested in what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you need for sure. Yeah. It has to be organic. Yeah. I'll show you my TikTok later. It's my daughter's doing food reviews, yeah. toy reviews. Okay. Yeah. Again, I tried to it. research you. I couldn't find oh. anything on social because uh, I Lauren locked it down. Johnson. Yeah, I locked it down. Yeah. 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 You can't find me. I dare. <laughs> I dare anyone. <laughs> Johnson is like a needle in a haystack. You yeah. Know? You, you ever want to, you know, hide from the government or anything, just name yourself Johnson Smith or. Yeah. You have no idea what I'm capable of. It's all, it's all hidden. Well, I was wondering, you know, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to end up getting into this interview and we're going to like find out that she has a background from the CIA. Yeah. Or, right. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm a good investigator as well. So okay. it goes both ways. I'm, I'm secret, but also I can figure anything out. It's I, a skill. I'm a little intimidated. It's a skill. <laughs> it's a woman's skill, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah, I think we're all built in, built in investigators. But no, I'm I'm super excited for Phoenix and to hear about your your podcasts. They won't be as cool as this one, I'm sure. No, no, no. <laughs> this is going to be the best one yet. Duh. Uh, Duh. For sure. But no, I think we did awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Refresh Man, and I'm here to empower you to take charge of your destiny. Are you tired of working for someone else? Do you dream of making a difference in your community and unleashing your full potential? Then look no further than Refresh Franchising. With us by your side, you can start your own heroic business venture with the unwavering support and cutting-edge resources you need to conquer your goals. Our franchise model is like a super serum that will give you the strength to succeed. Refresh provides extensive training, ongoing mentorship, and an established brand with a loyal customer base. Plus, you'll become part of a heroic league of entrepreneurs who serve as allies on your journey towards greatness. And the best part... You won't have to waste time building your business from scratch like some kind of neophyte. With Refresh Franchising, you'll hit the ground running at lightning speed and unlock the key to heroic financial success. So gather your courage, summon your inner superhero, and visit RefreshFranchising.com to launch your heroic franchise journey. Always remember, together, we can achieve greatness.